Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tawana Rivers. I'm the CEO of the 10K Project, and we are here again this week to lift up another amazing Black founder in our Bet on Black pitch. We have a returning founder here. I go. I always get so excited when we have a founder come back because that means we added enough value to their previous raise that they thought we needed to be a part of the second one as well. And so Kwaku, thank you so, so much for coming back and joining us. I am so excited to see what you've done over the last couple of years. Farm to Flame um, is one that's in my personal portfolio and many of the portfolios of our um, uh, members here tonight, but I'm super excited to hear about your updates. But what I'm gonna do first is I am going to share my screen and pull up your campaign page, right? Because we always wanna tell the people where to go in order to invest in you. And we will be putting the campaign in the chat throughout the evening. So we don't have to worry about that at all. We'll make sure that people get the campaign. And when we send out the replays and post it and all of that stuff, we will also have the campaign link in there. So let me just share my screen. All right, hopefully you guys can see that. Farm to Flame is on WeFunder. So I won't spend a whole lot of time here because you guys are very familiar with this WeFunder page. We come here most often of all of the portals. Uh, to date, the campaign has raised $231,200. Congratulations. Uh, the minimum investment is $250. Um, as always, there are some investor perks that are included. And you guys know, I always tell you, look at every single thing on a campaign page because the, the founders put a lot of energy into making sure that what they put here is what they know you need to know in order to understand the project and um, uh, be able to do some of your due diligence. So there's a lot of information that is listed here. Obviously the team, uh, as you click on details, updates, the part I like the most, right, and I always say this, is the ask a question section because it's where, as an investor, if you have a question, you can ask it here and the founder and or his team members will answer your questions here. One of the reasons I love this so much is other people ask questions and we learn a lot, at least I do, I learn a lot from the other questions that people are asking. And then it helps me know what kind of questions I need to be asking that maybe I didn't realize I should be asking as I go through my due diligence process. So I will leave that there. I will stop sharing. Kwaku, I am gonna turn it over to you, sir. Welcome back again. So excited to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Tawana. I appreciate it. And I'll get right into my presentation, which has a short intro about me so I can merge those two things together. Nice. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen? It's starting to share now. Awesome. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is KJ. I'm CEO and co-founder of farm to flame energy. And we provide smokeless, odorless, renewable power at half the cost of diesel. We're tackling the $4.4 trillion global power market. And we're specifically disrupting the $23 billion diesel generator market. Our serviceable obtainable market goal is $3.4 billion in annual recurring revenue by 2032 with 4 million kilowatts or 150,000 farm to flame generators installed. In most of the US, getting electricity is as easy as turning on a switch, but 700 million people around the world do not have access to affordable and reliable clean electricity. This population relies on expensive and dirty diesel generators 
for constant power. It costs three to four times the regular electricity price on the grid to operate diesel generators. And toxic diesel exhaust kills over 21,000 people per year. And if for some reason they can't get their hands on diesel fuel, well, they have no power. We've built the farm to flame generator, a carbon neutral electricity asset that is just as reliable as diesel, but half the cost with no smoke and no odor. We utilize feedstocks like corn stalks, wood waste, miscanthus, and paper waste for carbon neutral electricity generation. And one of our 30 kilowatt generators can power three homes, a commercial building, or a medium sized farm. Our patented smokeless and odorless combustion process has allowed us to achieve a blue flame, equating to high combustion purity, less maintenance than traditional wood chip generators, and increased revenue. Here's a real picture of the blue flame we achieved, and this is a power generation demonstration video of the FTF 30 kilowatt generator that we built in 2021 with funding from the US Environmental Protection Agency and the New Jersey Clean Tech Pilot Demonstration Grant. And we're cheaper than existing options. We're cheaper than diesel by half. We're cheaper than solar plus storage by two thirds as a battery paired with the panels, prohibits cost-effective base load power. And we're cheaper than anaerobic digestion by half. Farm to flame generators operate at 14 cents per kilowatt hour with no methane, no conflict minerals, and no toxic emissions in our carbon neutral supply chain. And we have a unique fuel processing procedure that allows the smokeless odorless flame to persist during electricity generation. We fine grind sawdust sized material to achieve smokeless combustion. And we also utilize LIDAR machine learning to assess fuel quality by removing non-viable components from the fuel stream, leading to increased fuel stream purity, generator uptime, and revenue. We make money with energy as a service agreements, also known as power purchase agreements. This agreement costs the customer 14 cents per kilowatt hour, structured just like an electricity bill that you receive at the end of the month. They don't pay for the upfront cost of the equipment, but they experience savings on diesel over a 10 year contract. This affords us a 2.6 year payback period on the equipment. And the average 10 year contract revenue equals $250,000 at 40% profit margins. We have $20 million in the pipeline for 2024 to 2026. We are signed into a $20.4 million engineering procurement and construction agreement, plus a three-year operation and maintenance contract with Cocoa Processing Company, a large chocolate producer for Golden Tree, in which we are converting their cocoa husks into combined heat and power. And we are signed into a services agreement with Georgia Pacific, the largest wood waste electricity producer in the country, in which we are providing a $1.7 million annual recurring revenue replacement of their natural gas paper dryers with farm to flame dryers. We have a world-class team of co-founders and executives who have built the Farm to Flame Generator and have been funded by world-class organizations including Cisco, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Bank of New York Mellon, and Georgia Pacific for over $2 million in non-diluted funding. And we have a great team of advisors who successfully raised and exited over $300 million in their previous companies, selling to BMW, General Electric, IPO, and recently Michelin. The $5 million raise enables Farm to Flame Energy to install 1,000 kilowatts of Farm to Flame generators on the East Coast in our seed stage, creating an additional $1.1 million in annual recurring revenue to the $22 million in existing projects we have. We will commence installment of over 50 megawatts, $50 million annual recurring revenue of Farm to Flame generators. And we will hire a world-class team of operators, engineering managers, and sales leaders to help us get there. Over the next 24 months, we will abate over 396,000 tons of carbon dioxide from diesel and natural gas. Join us as we scale to four gigawatts with over $3.4 billion per year in revenue and $12 billion in carbon neutral electricity assets as we expand energy security globally. Thank you. My name is KJ, CEO and co-founder of Farm to Flame Energy. And that's it. I'll take any questions and Please. thank you.
Nice. Oh, I love this slide to show all your partnerships. This is this is how busy you've been since the last time you've joined us. I love this slide. <laughs> Very nice. All right, guys, that was short and sweet. Go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A section. And I will start. You said, Edward said KJ ain't playing around. <laughs> Not at all. It? We can see that. Not at all. So let's actually tell us about some of these partnerships if you can. I mean, these look like some big names. So, so please share some of what you've done with some of these partners. Yeah. So an important one as of recent is Bank of New York Mellon. That was a pitch um, that we won. It's called the Up Prize. It was a social impact prize um, in late 2023. And that was $150,000 we won first place. But in combination with that and a $250,000 grant from New Jersey, where I'm from, it's called the New Jersey Clean Tech Pilot Demonstration Grant. We were actually able to do that power generation demonstration, um, that video that was on the product slide, which is something that's really important to me. And I think a lot of our customers is like they want to see how it's going to work and that it works, you know, on their um, site. So even when we posted that video, we already had people saying, I, I want to buy this generator for my uh, farm in New York. Um, and people were really interested in it. And so that's um, something that I think is a big asset. And another great project was with Georgia Pacific. This is a uh, paper making company. And I think they're like the third largest paper making company in the US. And um, we were basically taking their paper pulp sludge um, to energy and doing a bunch of combustion tests for them. And we were able to successfully go through these pilot tests. And now we're just fine tuning and getting um, some data for the EPA before we can go forth for a scale up uh, where we're basically taking a hundred tons per day of their paper waste wow. uh, through heat. And it, it's, it becomes a circular economy because now they're using their paper waste to actually make more paper to dry paper. That is wonderful. I loved how you also talked about, and you can stop sharing. Um, I love how you also talked about the fact that you're cheaper than solar. You know, I know personally, I've been hearing so much about solar these days. I think some new laws may have passed in different states because it's the buzz, right? I know I've, I've gotten more mailings even to my home about solar energies and having panels installed. The fact that your solution is uh, cheaper than that. Can you talk a little bit about that, specifically how you compare to solar energy? Yeah, for sure. So it's about the battery. Um, the panels themselves are are not too expensive. Like panels themselves are between 10 and 15 cents per kilowatt hour, but the battery can add another uh, 25 to 30 cents per kilowatt hour. And basically solar is not a 24 hour solution unless it has a battery. Um, because um, on average, um, solar panels are only really working for 30% of the year. Um, that's basically whatever angle you put the panel at, it's only experiencing so much sunlight a day for so many days a year. It depends where you live. Um, but on, on average, like the average U.S. capacity factor is like 30% for solar. So you need... Um, the battery uh, for the remainder of the year to have a 90%, 95% capacity factor. That basically means you're providing power for 90 to 95% of the year. We're farm to flame. We could provide power for 95% of the year just in the fact that it's waste to energy. So mm. before the project starts, we speculate how much waste do we need like for this a certain size generator, what may we need like 5,000 tons a year and we make sure we have those fuel supply agreements in place so that the generator is running 330 days at least out of the year with that waste. Wow. Thank you so much for explaining that. I did not realize that the solar panel still needed a battery. I did not know that. I assumed it was capturing light and sun throughout the, you know, and it was just running everything from that. I did not know a battery was needed. So thank you for that little education lesson. My pleasure. <laughs> Anonymous says, how are you incorporating the university? Uh, will, will you recruit new college graduates? Yeah, yeah. We we have um, actually college graduates working with us right now. Um, through the state of New York, 
It's called NYSERDA. It's the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. And they have a clean tech intern program. So we've been able to basically get 90% of our um, interns um, labor cost reimbursed through this NYSERDA program. We're extremely grateful for them because they've helped us do so many things. Um, they've helped us increase our marketing presence. They've helped us on our last WeFunder campaign. Um, we've, we, we even have um, interns helping us right now out of my alma mater, Carnegie Mellon University. And so that's definitely a really important part. Uh, in, in the future, as we have more of these generators running, we will bring them into the tech side a little bit more. Um, we've just been working with like a lot of industry veterans on the tech side uh, because they have that experience. Like we've hired um, industry vets who've worked in biomass plants or in coal power plants before uh, so that they could really help bring in that um, expertise to this technology. Um, but we still even do have engineering help from some um, college graduates as well. Nice. Sarah said, if you're able to share, do partners like GP, Koch, um, and Cisco have ownership stake in your company? Oh, no, they, they do not have ownership stake. So Georgia Pacific was just a customer. Um, Cisco is a, a, we won a competition in 2022. It was a grant. Um, from Cisco it was called the Global Prob Global Problem Solvers Challenge, and so they funded us with that grant, and so they're they're a grant provider. Um, so these companies they don't have ownership of Farm to Flame. Nice, Miss Patrice says that she noticed in the key in in your key hires that there was a CEO. Um, why and where are you going? That is me, and the reason I put that is because up until actually about two months ago. Uh, I've been foregoing a salary uh, in order to reinvest into all the equipment and the the project, like the labor costs to get the generator running. And so in order to fully expand Farm to Flame and really get us to one megawatt, I will be taking a salary. So will my CCO. And we're in the process of onboarding a uh, new CCO right now. And yeah, that that's what it is. It's been a, um, it's been a long road, but basically this company has been going on for about five years and just started to <laughs> pay myself. So, yeah. Wow. Talk about skin in the game. I mean, that is the ultimate testament of making sure you do everything to make this business successful and have, you know, make sure it has longevity. I mean, to forego a salary, that means you're, you're getting money somewhere else to take care of yourself and that then you're taking care of this business as well. So you know, when I think about this from an investor standpoint, you're the kind of entrepreneur and founder that I want to support, right? Because you're showing that this means everything to you and you're doing everything you can to make it successful. And that's really important. You see, sometimes you, you will see videos of people who have businesses and, you know, it's all about the Lamborghinis and the this and the that, right? And it makes it look attractive, but true entrepreneurship is sacrifice and it, it in, in making the business grow. And so I'd rather support a founder like you than somebody that's super flashy, maybe not putting enough money back in the business. So congratulations for that. I know that had to be, you know, hard decisions to make, but necessary. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, everything you said, I resonate with everything you said is just, um, you got to put your life into it. You know, I mean, if you want it to be successful, it, it just takes a lot of a lot of sacrifice and a lot of discipline. And so I think just growing through Farm to Flame more and more, I learned that. And, um, you know, I learned there's so many ways, there's so many ways to accomplish a goal. Um, you just got to be creative. Yeah, yeah. Kevin said, compare what consumers would be paying using your technology and offering with what they are paying for power now. Yeah. So specifically with a diesel generator owner, um, which would be at a larger scale, that's 30 cents per kilowatt hour that they pay. Thank you, Jackie. How are you doing? I remember you investing. And 14 cents per kilowatt hour is farm to flames price. So it's about half half the cost of diesel. Yeah. You have a little more than half. Wow. That's yeah. huge. To save a 50% savings on anything is a big deal. Not to mention energy, right? Something that we need and consume a lot of. 
Yeah, all day, all day, for sure. Um, there, there's an aspect too of um even like having a a waste tipping fee. A lot of companies that we work with, they have to pay to get their waste removed. So if a company um has to pay like twenty dollars per ton to get their their waste removed, um, and they have a hundred tons a day, then that's like two thousand dollars a day just to remove waste. We could completely eliminate that, you know, completely eliminate that by turning their waste, like their liability into an asset. So not only are we saving them money on their on their current electricity or heating solution, but we're also completely cutting out a tipping fee, um, which is, you know, on their balance sheets. It's just it's keeping them from doing other things that they could with that money. Yeah. Anonymous says, can you give an example of application to a 2,500 square foot house? So in one of your slides, you talk about the smallest generator uh, being able to power three houses, right? Is what you said on the slide? So how does how does that work? Yeah, so basically it's it's about it's about kilowatts. Like a, basically like 10 kilowatts can power one home approximately. Um, and I would I would say that would be like a a 1500 to 2000 square foot home. So 30 kilowatts is three homes um, or a commercial building. Like our, our building here is a commercial building and it can it can be powered uh, with uh, about 30 kilowatts. And so, I mean, this is a 10,000 square foot building, but I think the thing that matters more is how much electricity are you consuming within the building? So, you know, you, just, you, you want to calculate how much electricity uh, that you need and, and you can see, um, you know, that's that's basically where we're at. Nice. Very good. Um, Anonymous says, what's the investment ask? Anonymous, um, if you want to go to the campaign page, uh, Talisha has put the link there. Um, currently, they are at the $231,000 mark. The minimum investment is two hundred and fifty. dollars What's the max you're looking for? $5 million? Yes. Yeah. So it says two hundred and fifty, just because that's our, our minimum goal minimum. is from outside plus 50 um, on the minimum goal of the WeFunder campaign. But after we get to that 250, I think it should update um, or at least say first goal hit, um, mm -hmm. you can still invest. Yeah, I love that you're so close to the minimum already and you really just relaunched the campaign. That is just, a, it's a testament to, to the amazing work you and your team are doing. Um, uh, Ms. Patrice says, how is your process protected? Can you talk about your patents or anything that you may have to protect um, all of the the IP and, and just making sure nobody comes and scoop, scoops this up from under you? Somebody who already has 5 million. Indeed, indeed. This is a good question. This is actually why we started this company. Um, I have a slide I can share about this. Um, so we started this company because my co-founder, his grandfather and uncle, patented the combustion process that we use. That's Will, that's my co-founder. And um, I'm gonna show the patent number. Right here is our patent. And um, yeah, so this is a world patent. It's basically protecting the, the way we burn the fuel. So we would pulverize the fuel, like we'll take sawdust, and we'll pulverize it to a fine powder. And basically we burn it in a, 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 a pneumatic um, way. Like we, we blow it through, through an airstream into a combustion chamber. And this combustion chamber, this burner, it has a certain design that allows us to burn it with really low carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is basically smoke. It's like the black smoke that comes off the exhaust when a diesel generator is working inefficiently. And so we've gotten really low carbon monoxide profiles, like under 50 parts per million, or traditional biomass, where like just burning wood chips, it's like 300 parts per million. Diesel, when it's running inefficiently, is like 1,600 parts per million. So this is why we, we started this. Um, and it also makes our combustion efficiency higher. It makes our combustion efficiency like 95% or higher, where typical wood chips is 78% efficiency. So we get a little bit more energy out of the fuel for this process. And that's ultimately why we started, why we started the company. Um, so that that's our that's our pattern. Nice. Very good. Um, Cheryl Reese had a question. Cheryl, you, I, 
I noticed you put a different question by mistake in the Q&A, so I'll read yours out of the chat. Uh, she said, what would the physical connectivity to the home or business entail? Yeah, so you have grid interconnection. Uh, basically, you would be connecting um, two transmission lines uh, you, so you can meter back to the grid, or you can connect um, to a net meter. Like your grid, like say you had National Grid or Con Edison, they can come and install a net meter in your home or um, your business. And that would be uh, hooked up to Farm to Flames Generator to basically push power to the grid uh, whenever uh, you're not consuming. And so that's actually similar to a project we're going to do for Vermont. It's a furniture company called Linden Furniture. And we basically will be metering to the grid. Um, they'll technically still be consuming grid electricity, but they'll be getting a credit, basically like offsetting their electricity bill um, from the grid. And, and that, that allows us to... Uh, that allows us to earn that continuous revenue from having the generator running um, 24 seven. So yeah, it's basically a net, it's a net meter. If, if say you, if say it was um, someone wanted the generator so they could net meter and then during blackouts, they could uh, access the power. Well, basically there's a thing called the transfer switch, the automatic transfer switch. And it switches the generator um, it switches your property being run between the generator and grid power. So in that blackout, the transfer switch will kick on for the generator then to power your property. Wow. It's, it's funny because it's um, obviously this is not our business. You made that sound very simple. And I know there's so much that goes into making that happen. <laughs> but you there's a lot. There's like a lot. Like it's like a plug and sure. play. <laughs> Yeah, and and that's the goal is that you that you just get it to be plug and play, and it's like and and it really can be. That's where we're getting to, but it takes a lot. Um, it does. You you just you you have to um do a lot of work in the beginning. Um, and we take care of all that. Like when it comes to talking with the grid, making sure you have the right permits. Um, you not only do you need grid interconnection permits, um, but you also need um air quality permits. So we make sure that we fall in line with the air quality permits for each state. Each state has different permits around um, particulate matter, which is like um, the fly ash, um, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides. Like we, we make sure we fall in all these limits and, um, and also all the grid interconnection laws um, that our power quality is the right way that we're, you know, within um, like 2% of, the 60 Hertz, which is like the national electric code rated frequency for electricity. And um, and then, you know, just a few a few others, just making sure uh, we get everything right to provide the power. So, you know, I, I make it sound simple, but it, like, as you see in the video, you see me working out there and I'm also working mm -hmm. with different operators. And, and now we have managers who are gonna be managing those operators. But, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, but, um, it's beautiful when the system is running. It's just amazing. Yeah. Wow. So I'm going to go to Sarah's question next. It kind of ties into something I was just thinking. So Sarah said she didn't have the privilege of hearing your uh, first presentation with us. Uh, why do you feel uniquely compelled to tackle the energy crisis in this way? And I love this question because there's this glow about you when you start talking about the process. <laughs> And Love so it, yeah. how did you, how did you start? How did you get into energy? How did this become the passion? That's a good question uh, from Sarah. I appreciate it. Um, when I was in high school, I took environmental science classes and I had a good teacher. Um, his name was Mr. Fick and he was a great teacher. Um, I think something in that class, I just saw like in developing nations, like in different countries like Bangladesh, in different countries in Africa and the Congo, like they were having like a lot of water problems. And for some reason, I just got drawn towards doing water treatment. I, um, my parents are from Ghana. So like, you know, I can understand like the different problems that are going on um, in other, uh, other nations. And I just wanted to do water treatment. And then I did, I, I, when I went to undergrad, I went to Syracuse University. 
I started in environmental engineering. Like I later switched to chemical and I actually did my master's in environmental. But um, I, I realized that there's a lot of areas that are linked to water treatment, like a big problem with uh, technology they're trying to scale to take the salt out of water, um, which is reverse osmosis or desalination, my, my apologies, desalination is it's really energy expensive. It takes a lot of energy to remove the salt from water with the filter. You need like pressure to like push it through the filter. Um, so just having a lower cost energy solutions um, or, or at least ones that can use waste heat or some type of waste heat and energy for the um, water treatment. That was something that was interesting to me. So when my co-founder came to me and he was like, hey, I wanna turn this patent into combustion process into a generator. I thought like long-term, like this may even help with water treatment in the future too. Mm. Um, is right up my alley. Um, so that's that. I did a lot of research too in labs. I was working in different labs where one of my professors did biodiesel uh, production, like he made biodiesel. Um, another one did like combustion experiments um, for the auto industry um, with biofuel as well. So like the, this was kind of just stuff I was learning. It's, the opportunity just felt right when it came about. Nice, very good. You talked to us about the installation process, but the actual unit, is it the entire, so in the slide, we saw it look like it was almost in a storage container. Is the unit the actual storage container and its contents, or is it just the the contents that we saw when you opened the doors of the storage container? Oh yeah, it's the actual storage container and its contents, like it's everything. So basically the generator fits into two 20 foot shipping containers. It could fit into a 40 foot container. Um, and, and with that model, we could fit up to 500 kilowatts in, in a 40 foot container. But for things like larger plants, like that we would build for like corporations, it would just be an on-site power plant. But the whole point of that is that it could have storm resiliency. Like you could rise the generator above flood levels wow. and that you can basically transport it. I mean, anywhere in the world, like if you, if you need, if you wanted this generator um, at this site for two years and this site for five, you, you can transport it um, at anywhere. So that, that, that was the reason why we did that, why we put in the generator, but basically in one of the containers, there is in this current FTF S2 generator we have, there's a boiler, um, there's a steam turbine slash alternator, which is basically the generator. It spins and generates electricity. And then the exhaust of that steam turbine goes to a second container, which has a condenser. This turns the steam back into water and that recycles into the feed water tank and then back into the boiler. So it's a closed loop. And um, yeah, so we basically have a boiler, pressurized steams driving the turbine and it comes back into the boiler. Uh, that happens within those two containers. Interesting. How, I was watching the other day, it was, it, I don't know if it was a documentary or where I saw it, but I, I think I clicked on something and it, it intrigued me. I click on a whole lot of weird stuff, but this one was about Bitcoin mining. And because I do, I love blockchain, love everything about it, right? It was it was about Bitcoin mining and they were at, they were actually um, touring solar farms, trying to find energy to be more efficient with the Bitcoin mining. Um, and then they went to like wind turbine farms and they they showed all of this in this video I clicked on. Is this a solution for that also? Or could it be? Yeah, we've had some people reach out to us about that for sure. Um, and yeah, it, it really depends just what you're doing. Some people are using diesel to Bitcoin mine, which is really expensive, um, especially like uh, startups who are coming up and everything like that. That's like 30 cents per kilowatt hour. So right off the bat, we're half of that. Um, and the fact that they need it all day long, that capacity factor, that's what plays into it. Um because you know what once you have that solar, you need you need to make sure you have the capacity factor that can mine for them and do those calculations right. all day long. Cause that's what a lot of, of Bitcoin mining is, just computers working and using right. energy to like do a calculation and make um the token have like a special code, like a unique code or something. So they have to uh use that energy. And so yeah, that we've we've had we definitely have people ask us about that. 
it, it's it's not really our focus because what what we have is money on the front end and the back end like basically there's waste so it's like we can not only like save you money on waste but we can save you money on energy as well so we target a lot of corporations who have like a waste stream or i mean really they target us like all of the corporations we're working with they reached out to us um but that's what we learned like that's our biggest value proposition however we wouldn't be opposed to um working working with uh bitcoin mine and we definitely have people reach out to us about that in the nice. past two years oh good interesting rudolph says in texas i live in a in a con in a county excuse me that has a log of rice farmers uh do any of the feedstock use any type of feedstock like rice or corn or soybean byproducts just curious there's a lot of farmers and ranchers in this area texas is not part of the um federal grid uh, there's a huge initiative to build the infrastructure. The cost of electricity is increasing exponentially. Uh, are there opportunities for land development to sell electricity on the grid using your generators? Texas has a strange regulatory system. Also, Texas going towards carbon neutral is going towards carbon neutral. Yeah, for sure. That's a good question. And yeah, we we have actually generated electricity with corn stalks, and we even keep some stocked in our our warehouse. Um, so that uh, we haven't tried rice husk yet, but we we know that rice husk will burn from other biomass power plants, you know, burn, burning that. And um, you know, I know that um, Texas is like is deregulated. Um, I'm I'm sure that there's ways that you can still go about net metering um, as long as you follow and fall within all the uh, grid grid regulation. And so that that's definitely a, a, a good point to mention. Um, even Pennsylvania is deregulated too. So there's certain things that we have to make sure we do when we uh fall fall into um metering laws and everything and everything like that. And so there, you know, there's there's certainly Texas is like the biggest energy state, I think, you know, and, and in terms of renewable energy coming about. Um they just have so much expansion with all types of renewable energy. So it's like, there's a lot of opportunity over there. Even Bill Gates, he said he just, he was just in Texas in February uh, to understand what the future of energy is going to look like. So that's a, a like a, a, a great area for us to um to be in that market and tackle. And we have suppliers in Texas too, like for our steam turbines and everything. So um through the, the expertise that's in our network and our supplier network, you know, we can we can learn more about expanding um, into that into that market. Rudolph's question makes me think about black farmers and how many of them are losing their farms because they don't have buyers for some of their crops. I wonder if <clears throat> you've done any work with um, black farmers that have some of these products that you can use. Yeah, ironic. This generator is built for Think and Grow Farms, the 30 kilowatt generator that we showcased on the product slide. Think and Grow Farms, they're a black owned farm in Pennsylvania. They're near Philadelphia. And um, back when we won an EPA grant in 2021, we got introduced um, to them because the CEO, uh, Jamie Green, she actually um, works in the um, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And so we've basically, like all the work we've been doing is getting ready to deploy this generator on their site. And um, yeah, they've, they've been great. Um, they, they do urban farming education. Um, they, they, they're also in the, in the process right now of doing a new uh, biomass boiler where they're basically um, getting energy data from burning hemp pellets. And so there's a lot of excitement around what they're doing right now. And um yeah, I, I definitely I definitely can see us working with a lot more farms, you know, a lot more black owned farms and um, just farmers here in the name. Farmers, you know, will, re will reach out to us. Um, oh, that's true. And, and it, it's, it's a great thing because we, we can see how much waste they have on site, even if they don't have enough waste on site to run the generator 24 seven. We can partner with landscaping companies um, in the nearby areas uh, who already pay. To dispose of their waste and say, hey, you can just give it to us for half of that, or you give it to us for free. Um, and if so the that is another benefit too. Nice. 
Ms. Patrice says, can cities use this process to utilize their green waste? Does the input have to be pure? I say pure, considering all the junk people put in their trash cans. Yeah, so with municipal waste, um, because there's like a type one and type two municipal waste, and one of them is like um, more of like the garbage and the other is like recycled material, like plastics and paper. Um, we tend to stay away from that uh, because there is a lot of sorting work that has to be done. A large portion of the waste that we tackle is um, landscaping waste because it is more pure and there's still an abundance of it. This still is green waste. So um, like in a city of um, Atlantic City, there's there's a green waste yard where landscapers come and they dump all their waste. And um, sometimes it gets sold for mulch, but oftentimes it's just the excess that just sits in that in that area and they have to pay 10, 20, sometimes $30 per ton to get it disposed of. So that could be, you know, that could definitely be a problem and we can eliminate, you know, that fee for them by basically just taking their waste and converting it to energy. But that type of waste is like yard trimmings, woody debris, like a mainly woody debris, like branches, twigs, um, even some of the green, um, like the leafy green from that waste uh, we, we can use for energy as well. So that's what we like to focus on. Um, any other processed waste, paper pulp sludge, cocoa husks, rice husks, different types of waste that is in a process. Um, that That's another one too. Mushroom blocks is another one that we're now learning about. I'm always amazed what we learn at these Bet on Black sessions because my brain is moving. Yeah, we're, you know, as entrepreneurs and as some people in the community that try, they want to be entrepreneurs, but they haven't yet picked what their niche is going to be, right? As you're talking about waste, I'm I'm sitting here saying there's money in waste. Like, and I guess I knew that, you know, at the end of the day, because we recycle and you hear that. But like from this standpoint, this is an opportunity for somebody who's interested in starting a business and really think about how they can create maybe a waste business, make sure it's green or pure and, and seek out companies like yours, right? Or exclusively yours and be able to then sell this to you. I just think as a community, we need to think outside our boxes, right? Um, and really think about all the other industries that are looking for solutions from us. Uh, this conversation just is, is making my, my head spin a little bit because my brain's moving a mile a minute thinking how everything you've talked about here tonight is so beneficial um, and it's opening up a whole new um, education uh, avenue for us to really be thinking about. So thank you for that. Indeed, my pleasure. Anonymous says, um, I'm not sure I understand. Will the unit work through their HVAC um, and also wants to consider how it would affect their yard? <laughs> yeah. So with HVAC, we can do combined heat and power. So this is not only electricity, but it's also heat. So we can basically use the waste heat off of the exhaust stack to pass through like a radiator. So this radiator has, um, it, has it, it has water and it's basically like transferring the, the heat to make hot water. You can even make low pressure steam with the heat um, that comes off of the exhaust. So that's basically how, and, and then it will go through your HVAC ducting. Um, and so that's how we could, that's how we could do that essentially for HVAC. Okay. And Bernard says, maybe I missed it, but what's your target location next year? Um, how did Nigeria pilot program? How did Nigeria pilot the program? Yeah, so we didn't yet pilot in Nigeria. We we want to focus on um, the Northeast, uh, really the whole East Coast and getting a thousand kilowatts installed here, you know, before uh, moving into uh, de developing nations. And, um, but our focus for next year is Vermont. We have this cocoa processing company project as well, which is actually in Ghana. So this, this is a, a chocolate making plant in Ghana. It's one of, it's one of the largest. Um, so that actually is a corporation in a developing nation. And um, so there's that project, but there's a Vermont one. That's, one of our our strongest focus because it's a uh, 300 kilowatt generator similar to the model we have right now in the shipping containers um where we're basically using a combination of their wood waste and landscaping waste to power uh their sawmill 
And so that that's that's a project in focus. We have some other potential ones in the pipeline, like with a farm in New York, uh, where they're basically expanding and they want us to build a new generator for their um, farm waste. And so th those are those are two areas that we're going into. Very, very good. Um, Tracy said uh, that she missed your first pitch, but she's glad to be here for this one and that she's so proud of you. Thank you, Tracy. I appreciate that a lot. And Kevin said he could see smoke coming off my head. Kevin, you know how this brain works, right? I think my brain is like, <laughs> if money, what you know, when people ask you that question, if money wasn't an object, what would you do? I'd do all the things. Because <laughs> my brain is filled. Every time somebody says something, I think of a business that would be amazing. And I'm doing that. My brain is doing that right now. But my, but we we need five million for KJ tonight. <laughs> we gonna focus on that. That's tonight's mission. Well, that's how it should be. I mean, innovation is what just keeps the world moving. It's like yes. the creative space is where money's made. And sometimes it feels like I don't have time to think like this. But I learned sometimes if I just pause and take a second to think about it, I might learn something that saved a whole lot of money down the line. So that's it. And sometimes it's a very small change, right? Yeah, it could be right next to what you're doing. Innovation yeah. does not have to look like this. Sometimes it's this little thing that you can do differently that makes a huge impact and changes the world. And so I don't get me started. I did. <laughs> <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> Caleb said. What's the cost of your unit versus similar diesel units? So well, the cost of this unit is three, like the capital cost of the unit is $3,000 per kilowatt. So I'm not exactly sure what diesel is. Um, I think it's between like, I don't want, I don't even want to quote it, but I know that our capital cost is more expensive than diesel. I know that the cost of the generator is more expensive than diesel. It's the operating cost that's 14 cents per kilowatt hour, which is half the operating cost of diesel. So it's really the diesel fuel itself is what's expensive uh, as compared to everything needed to generate electricity, including the fuel in a farm to flame generator. And and I mean, would you would you venture to say that the part of this that's priceless is diesel is not environmentally friendly or as friendly as what you're doing, right? Yeah, it, it's just like biomass is considered carbon neutral. And so basically, Diesel is is straight um, hydrocarbons, and that really does promote global warming and climate change. It promotes the greenhouse gases. The thing about biomass is like anything that is burned is going to be absorbed by plants in the growing process um, within a one to two year period, or whatever the growing cycle is of that plant. Um, it probably it could be like five years for a tree to grow, ten years. But when you're talking about um, fossil fuels, the reason why they call it fossil fuels is because the carbon is literally as old as the fossil, which is millions of years old. So you're letting out millions of years worth of CO2 into the atmosphere right now. So it would take another million years to get that same amount of CO2 back in to the ground. Um, and so that's what's really causing global. Okay. Thank you for that. That wow. So, so again, priceless. <laughs> I mean, like, right? I mean, your solution is literally not harming the environment. It's saving the environment from the harm that is already being caused to it. Um, and so, with that said, I mean, we need that was T. Brooks. Wasn't that a great explanation? From that standpoint, we need many, many more of your units out there so that we can try to counterbalance what's going out there, what's going on already in the world. I mean, we all we all see the effect of global warming more so now than ever before. I, I don't I don't know scientific scientific stats, but I feel like it's getting worse, right? I mean, there's just so much instability. And um at some point we've we've got to focus on solutions like yours to if we're if we're if we're, if we're we talk about this generational wealth, right? We're not gonna be here to have it if we don't do something about the environment. And so when we talk about wealth building, we need to be considering companies like this as we talk about generational wealth 
because this is the these are the kind of solutions that are going to keep the planet safe uh, so that we can all have good lives uh, while we're here. Um, Rudolph says, just an FYI, the National Black Farmers Association, president and founder of the NBFA, John W. Boyd, is a fourth generation farmer and a civil rights activist. So thank you for that tidbit, Rudolph. Very nice. Jesse said, sorry, I joined late. Is the solution a sales slash purchase solution or is it a turnkey lease type option? So your unit costs $3,000. Let's say Jesse wants it for his house. What, what is that? Is that a one-time cost? Then he get pays monthly, for, one time for setup, then he pays, you know, as the usage uh, fee comes or how does that work? Yeah, so it's, it's $3,000 per kilowatt. So a hundred kilowatt is three hundred thousand um, dollars. So that basically, because of that capital cost, we understand some customers may need a leasing solution. When you're talking about a corporation like who needs like a five megawatt generator, that's like fifteen million dollars. And so to them, it's like, when is our payback period? Um, you know, when are we going to see this payback period? And right now our generator payback period with the savings on your current solution um, or the solutions that we basically go against is like a little under three years. Now, if you wanted to lease the generator, I actually have a slide on this. Um, let me pull this up. And for those of us that have connections with large organizations that we think would could benefit, you know, from um, um, a solution like this, we need to be connecting them and telling them about Farm to Flame. Indeed, indeed. So this is like the, um, basically, this is the equipment financing structure. So if you have a, um, a generator, we can work with equipment financiers, where basically you put down like 25% of the, um, and it's actually together we put down 25%. So far the plane puts down half, we put down half, um, or the customer puts down half. And then there's an equipment financing bill. So depending on the size of your generator, like for an 100 kilowatt generator, that could be um, 3,000 per month for 60 month lease. And, and so we basically like break it into a way where it's payable over the time period that you're working um, with the generator on. So now the, your operational cost, which is basically like, what does it cost to actually produce this electricity? That's the remaining portion of the 10K per month revenue um, off of that 100 kilowatt. So you have you have different structures you can work with. For a um, corporation like Georgia Pacific or Cocoa Processing Company, they prefer a model that we actually put on this slide and um, it's called engineering procurement and construction um, or operation and maintenance. So engineering procurement and construction is basically like Farm to Flame being the EPC, we sell the generator to them. So basically we do everything to get it up and running and we we sell that to them. Now, we may be able to go and do an operation and maintenance contract depending on their needs. Um, so that's basically saying to maintain the generator, um, any scheduled and unscheduled maintenance of the boiler, the steam turbine, anything that needs maintenance, we can enter a yearly operation and maintenance contract with them. But in this case, we would just be selling um, the generator or the power plant to them um, basically within like 30-ish percent uh, margins. And that's where we would get our margins at. Um, so it's different um, for like a smaller customer. They may want the equipment financing where they don't have to pay for that upfront cost of the equipment. Um, and then a corporation may just want to pay for the upfront cost of the equipment. Um, a lot of times they everybody will finance it though. It's just about um, the corporation may have their own internal um, equipment leasing or equipment financing structure. So that's how we go about it. Very nice. 
Any final questions for KJ? Rudolph says two questions. As you gather market share in the state, how will train how will you train people to do the maintenance fee? And will this training be with your company or through local university? That's a good question. That's a great question. So a lot of um, where we get our operation and maintenance help, um, even I uh, hear my steam turbine operator in there right now, is with a company called Plant Services Group. That's just one company. Um, but basically, these are um, power plant professionals. So they're sourcing talent um, from existing power plants. Keystone Power Plant is um, in in south southwestern Pennsylvania. That's a coal plant. I think it's like a little under 1,000 megawatts. Um, and so they have a lot of power plant talent that can help us with the operation and maintenance side of things. Um, and then we, and and there's another group uh, through them called Per Se, which is a talent agency. So they've been, they've actually been able to provide us talent that we use for our power generation demonstration. So these guys are control room operators, um, steam turbine operators, boiler operators, um, mechanics at like it's been it's such a wealth of knowledge working with them because these are the guys who do the o m contract and they just help us learn things and um innovate on our um on our technology and so whenever we would then bring in new pipelines of talent like younger pipelines we would have a lot of the older industry veterans training them with the standard operating procedure that we actually made for our farm to flame generator um, as well as operation and maintenance procedures that we, we go through as well. So that's like a lot of the areas um, that we find um, that there, there's help in is uh, power power plant um, contractors, even sometimes the union. Um, ultimately, uh, through the union, we found that help. Um, but, you know, we, we've learned how to optimize it because we understand that Sometimes if you go directly to the union, they can work a little slow. So we like to find a balance of who can go the fastest while still having that expertise. And that's where we, we landed right now. Nice. Jesse says, please get in touch with Tavis Smiley and his radio station, KBLA, 1580 AM, Los Angeles. And then he says, trust me, you will understand. Thank you. Okay. Let okay. me, let me. Let me write that down. Write that down. Yeah, yeah. When when somebody say trust me, you know, <laughs> you know it's serious. <laughs> you, you know they mean business, right? <laughs> oh goodness. KBLA. KBLA fifteen eighty AM. So that's the station name. Jackie also dittos that Tavis Smiley is a good source. Okay. Jesse, I feel like you need to email KJ and tell him more about what the trust me means. I feel I feel like there's a conversation that needs to take place there. <laughs> An intro would be great too. Yes, know? right, right. Yeah. KJ, put your put your contact information down there. So just in case oh, yeah. you know somebody does have one of these connects, they can hook you up. Just sent my email right there. Perfect. Jesse, grab that and reach out and and, and, and tell KJ that inside scoop. <laughs> yeah, um, Anonymous says, is this a long-term play or will you ever consider selling? So what's the exit plan? Yeah, so our, our goal would be to have an initial public offering a few years down the line. Um, you know, so there could be an exit opportunity there um, for investors. I, I do plan to really, you know, see this company out. This is something that I, I've decided, like, you know, I would like to spend 20 years and I, I wouldn't have a problem um, doing that. Um, but it's definitely like, um, it's definitely, it's definitely a, a long-term thing. We would be open, you know, to selling it, but the, the we, we realize there's a lot of value in like, um, you know, building it up and really making it something solid. So, that is what we do have planned in mind um, in order to see this, you know, this four gigawatt goal 
by 2032. Uh, so that's, you know, we when when we started this company, we really um did want to consider like at least 15 years out. Um, and, and, and so that's where we are right now. Kevin said, what would make you want to sell? <laughs> Take a guess. <laughs> um, hey, if, if the price is right, you know, we were selling it. But um, that's really, you know, that I can't think of anything else. I'm in terms of internal motivation. This is something I just, you know, I um, it's something I, I've just grown to love. And, um, you know, just to be able to build something. Uh, but also something that's really solves a problem. That's something amazing to me. And like, I wake up every day, just super excited, you know, to work. Like I have dreams of it. I'm not gonna lie, I have dreams about PowerPoints. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I just, um, I I think that, you know, it's something that, you know, I, I, I could see myself staying in the long term for. And um, really the only thing is the ticket price that would make me want to sell it, um, you know? Uh, not everything is peaches and cream. Like obviously, there's hard days, and, and everybody knows that with anything. Like mm -hmm. you know, every day, you know, you take it day by day, and you make the progress as you can. Um, but um, over average, I just know that we're going in an upward trajectory, and you know, we're we're making a lot of a lot of great strides. Things that I didn't even anticipate happening have have happened with Farmers Name. Nice. Yeah, Kevin Brooks says Built to Sell. So there's a book <laughs> uh, called Built to Sell by John Warrillow, I think is his name. And um, he talks about how, how how you build a business with the intent to have it uh, attractive for sale down the line whenever you're ready, right? Doesn't mean you have to, but but it leaves the option open for you and it makes the business ripe for a good offer. Uh, and so he said, you know, if the price is right, then... You, you can make that decision at the time. Miss um, Beulah says, is, uh, are you working with local electric company? Um, so right now, one that we're working with is called Vermont Public Power Authority. And that's basically uh, for the um, Vermont Furniture Project. It's like the interconnection and they have a project financing arm as well. So we've been working with them to basically make sure everything is ready for the interconnection to the grid when this generator's up and running. Um, so that's where we learn a lot about um, what it takes, you know, to connect in that state. With the New Jersey um, grant that we got for 250K, that was not only from the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, it was also from the New Jersey Commission of Science, Innovation and Technology and the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities. So the Board of Public Utilities, they specifically fund different clean energy projects that are putting um, power onto the grid um, or, or basically um, providing power directly on site, combination of both. So that's where we get to learn about a lot of the regulations and um, you know codes as well as the benefits of, of net metering. Nice. Caleb said, are you aware of Moses West and his atmospheric water generator? <laughs> so Caleb, actually there are quite a few. So I'm aware of Moses West, black man who maybe about, <clears throat> I think I probably first heard about him maybe seven or eight years ago. And he creates water using um, just the atmosphere, right? Turns the atmospheric pressure into water. Um, his solution, at least when I first heard about him, is this like gargantuan of a machine and a big truck, right? I've seen since Caleb, um, two companies that have really um, made this technology portable. There's one company, they're raising money right now um, somewhere, one of the crowdfunding platforms, um, they, um, it's kind of like a water, um, cooler in your house and it's using the atmosphere in, inside your home to produce a certain amount of water, uh, per day. So that technology has definitely, um, advanced over the years, but the very first time I ever heard about it was Moses West's solution, 
um, to it. So I don't know if he was the first. Um, I don't know if all of these people, like like many who had capital, right, to come and take that idea and now refine it, innovate it, make it a more portable solution. Um, but your love of of water, right? When you, when you talk about the 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 water, um, the uh, technology and stuff, and and making clean water, um, that solution did just that. Um, yeah. I mean, I would like to meet him. I mean, I. I have I've I've definitely heard of atmospheric water capture, um, but I haven't I haven't heard of him yet. So I mean, it would be great to meet him. There's a, a few brothers in clean tech. Um, you know, from what I imagine, I could name them on like two hands. Um, but you know, that's someone who I would like to I would definitely like to meet. Yeah, if anybody knows Mister Mister Moses, give that connect. Rudolph says, you have a great opportunity to be a vertical company, to impact communities. Nice to see a young person with this insight. Congratulations. Just a quick second question. The governor in Texas appoints a lot of appointees that regulate transmissional and distribute transmission and distribution through PUC or public utilities commissions. The kilowatt per hour charge by electric companies stable but transmission companies and distributions are capture cost savings for profit margins instead of passing cost savings on. Thanks for taking my question and comments. Best wishes to you. Indeed. Yeah, so um, uh, can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so I think the question is, uh, Rudolph, is this more a statement than a question? Um. The kilowatt per hour charged by electric companies, he said bad, he said bad typing. It was a statement. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like I didn't read a question mark in there, brother. Wait a minute. Yeah, brother, wait. <laughs> yes, it was a statement. So basically saying the kilowatt per hour charged by electric companies is stable, but transmission companies and distributions uh capture the cost savings for profit margin instead of passing it on to the customer. Um, and so yeah, so that's a very interesting point. This is another situation where, you know, I wonder I wonder how your solution for from for the customers who could work with Farm the Flame, even the big corporations, I wonder will they realize the savings, right, through their energy costs and then maybe pass it on to their customers in some of their products and services whatever they might be. So it's interesting. Yeah, that would that would have a positive effect, you know, all the way, all the way down the line. I mean, because yeah. with a with a lower cost, you can access more customers. So I mean, that that that's a huge benefit. Energy, yeah, from especially on a manufacturing standpoint, like at a unit scale, um, if it takes energy to make your product at a unit scale, that could have all the way down the value chain, um, good impact, good financial impact. Ms. Patrice is asking me to introduce you to Dr. Ahmad Glover. So Dr. Glover is the founder of Wiggle. Um, and Wiggle is, have you heard of Wiggle, KJ? Yeah. Okay. I've heard of Ahmad Glover, yeah. Yeah. So they so they do wireless energy, is their is their model. Um, and he's an he's an amazing brother. I, you know, I think that would be actually a good introduction. He has raised um I think they've raised like five million dollars like 40 times i mean I'm, I'm exaggerating but it's like a whole you know you know, everybody working on their first hundred thousand and, and and dr <laughs> dr glover has raised five million like four times and i don't think i'm exaggerating with four times but he's like like this is this is something he does really really well and even if just to mentor you on this process right that road to that five million dollars that you're looking for how he can help with that jack jackie that's a wonderful and was that Jackie or Miss Patrice that asked that question? That was Miss Patrice. Oh, he's doing another raise also, Jackie? Okay. I'm going to make that intro. I'll send you an email, uh, KJ, introducing you on the chain to Dr. Glover. Okay. Write that away as a takeaway. <clears throat> oh, they have saltwater generators also. You're right, Patrice. Yeah, they have saltwater generators as well. Very good. Very good. Any other questions for KJ? Oh, 
Okay. This was an amazing evening. I'm going to give my final words and then I'll ask you to take us home, KJ. Um, again, thank you so much for coming back to the 10K Project. Uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to have a founder here the first time, but to have someone want to come back is um, the ultimate thank you to this community. And so we appreciate you, um, you know, we know that investment crowdfunding is not an easy lift, right? Running a business and trying to raise capital is much uh, of, a, of a heavy lift, actually. And um, I'm just grateful to founders like yourself that do it and that give us the opportunity, the average everyday person to invest in something this amazing, right? Um, and this is not just uh, a personal venture for you this truly is life-changing technology. Uh, and so we all benefit from it, right? When when this works to the capacity you want it to work and you get the the, the kilowatt you're looking to you know, get in that Northeast corridor, and then you take this road show around the world, right? Um, it only changes and affects each and every one of our lives. And, and when I talked before about the generational wealth that we're looking to build financially, it only matters if we leave someone behind to take advantage of it, right? You all have all this money in the bank and all the great, great grandkids are dead because the ozone layer is, is, is in shambles, right? And so that's not a good plan. We need to be supporting businesses that support the environment and that overall support us and keep us alive and keep us healthy. Breathing healthy air is important to me, right? Uh, and so- you know, we we want to do our due diligence always, right? But we want to show up and show out when it is necessary to. And so I will I will say that I am not a financial advisor. I am not telling you what to invest in. Do your due diligence. But when you consider, if you consider asking or adding this uh, company into your portfolio, please don't just do it yourself. Tell a friend. Share, 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 share. KJ is trying to get to $5 million, which means he needs a lot of eyes on this campaign, right? And so um, the campaign speaks for itself. The business model speaks for itself, but he needs you to tell people that he exists, right? And so the more people you talk about this to, the more times you post this amazing company and their campaign link to your social media outlets, the more people that will click on it that trust you and they know you're not going to post no foolishness, right? So they're going to trust you and they're going to be like, what's this Miss Jackie clicked on? What Miss Miss, Miss Jackie post? Let me click on it and learn what she's putting out there because they trust you. And so please share this campaign, do your due diligence. You know, 5 million seems like a long way, but I'm going to tell you, We've seen campaigns get the money they need infused. We've got new people in our community every single day. We don't know the connections they have to money or how much money they have themselves. And so we want to make sure we act, right? And get our piece of that pie because you never know when he's gonna get the money infused and then the campaign's closed and then we miss our opportunity. So act responsibly, do your due diligence, but if this is something that you're interested in, please consider uh, adding this to your portfolio sooner than later, All right? KJ, what do you want to say to the community before you leave us this evening? Just thank you so much. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, there's a huge impact and it's like, you know, the, the, the value that you as an investor bring, like really just drives us a lot farther and it, and it directs our energy in a more focused area so much farther because we know we're accountable um to this goal of really getting these four gigawatts down and so yeah it's, it's definitely been a pleasure um i remember doing the calculation now i think it was like if everybody um in of uh, the bet on black network even invested just the minimum amount in our campaign we'll get like 1.6 million dollars through bet on black um, you know, to go towards these 1,000 kilowatts. And so that's huge. I mean, that that's amazing. And it's like, some people invest more, you know? So, I mean, just the fact that we have this amplitude of this network and with what we've seen from last year's race, you know, you, you guys have been a super important part of our journey. And so we're just extremely grateful and I appreciate all the love and support. 
Thank you. And after, you know, five years, you said you've been doing this. Congratulations to you, right? Businesses, Black or otherwise, making it to the five-year mark is a big darn deal, right? It's a big deal. And to know that you've done that without your team taking proper salaries and you have a product, this is not ideation anymore, right? You've got a thing that you can now sell. And so congratulations to you, brother, and your team also, because um, we know, you know, greatness doesn't happen in a capsule, right? We know you're surrounded by amazing people, and I'm so glad they're out there holding you down so that you can impact the world the way that you're doing. So congratulations to you on what you've already accomplished, and, and you're going to get where you need to be. You're going to get there. There's no doubt in my mind about that. You will get this money that you need. Um, we just got to get you get you some exposure and get you some connections. I'm going to make sure I hook you up with Dr. Glover because he's going to tell you some stuff he's got up his sleeve because um, he is not a gatekeeper. He's a very amazing gentleman and he wants to see other young black men also succeed. And so um, I know he's going to be very, very helpful. So thank you for, for recommending that also. Um, Tracy said, we got you, KJ. <laughs> thank you. That's wonderful. I appreciate you all. Very good. I saw one. Oh, T. Brooks said amazing. I thought it was a question, but it was just a comment. Amazing. All right. With that said, you guys know what you need to do. You've got the campaign link. We are going to um, put this on the Facebook page. We apologize that that couldn't live stream, but we'll go ahead and post this on the Facebook page and pump it up out there. Uh, for those of you who are here and you're in Facebook with us, once we post that replay, Go ahead and do me a favor and just like it, comment on it since we didn't live stream. Um, go ahead and, and just so we can keep it at the top of the um, of the, the feed. If you can guys can do that for me in Facebook once Talisha puts it out there, go ahead and comment. Great pitch. Um, you know, any comments you want. You don't got to say great pitch. I'm not, you know, I'm not a ventriloquist. I'm going to tell you what to say. But comment, please, <laughs> on what you thought about the pitch. And then that'll keep it at the top so that anyone... Uh, waking up in the morning, they can see it first thing for us. So we appreciate you guys coming to hang out with us as well. Enjoy the rest of your week. Be kind to yourselves. And KJ, thank you so much again. And I'm just so, so proud of you as well. Um, great work. Great work. You, you, we need to show this episode to our children. <laughs> we need to, we need to show this episode to our children on how you can have a passion for something that's not what everybody's talking about, right? Um, and this is this is a great episode. This is this is really good. Yeah. Thank you, KJ. Thank you. Yeah, this is so great. your parents are great. so proud of you. <laughs> hey. I hope so. They are. They are. They have to be. Yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Good night, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. You, everybody.